there. Thanks, everybody. How are you all doing this morning? OK, that was, that was a little scattered, I'm going to be honest. Um, I want to do a little thing with you. I did it for the first time last week in Tampa. So we'll see if New York can really like meet Tampa standards here right now. Um, because I actually want to know how you're doing this morning. I wasn't just saying that like in the way that people say, fine, how are you doing, fine. How are you doing, damn it. I just asked again that thing. Um, actually, I actually want to know how you're doing. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take just a second and think about how you're actually feeling right now. Are you feeling happy? Are you Are feeling sad? Feeling tired? Feeling hungry? Hungover? <laughs> angry? In love? Sleepy? Whatever it is, like think of that in your mind for a second. I'm going to count to three. And on three, we're all going to say how we're feeling, OK? So we're going to do one, two, three, and then feels, not one, two, feels, because otherwise we'll get all messed up. All right, so one, two, three, go. Ready? Has everybody got what they're, how they're doing? One, two, three, nervous. <laughs> OK, that was good. I like that. Um, so I'm going to do something a little different today. I've been doing this talk for about a year and a half since I made a movie, a documentary film about the web called What Comes Next is the Future. Um, and I've given it a lot. So I know this talk really, really well. And I could just sort of run through it in my sleep at this point. But I woke up this morning feeling like I want to do something different. I'm here in New York City amongst all you wonderful people. So we're going to try a little something, OK? Because um, I don't know if you guys have really noticed this, but like, the world's kind of a mess right now. Like, things are are not great, right? Um, and and maybe, maybe it's always been, um, but it certainly is now, like, pretty unfair. And with so much going on to be upset about, it's easy to be paralyzed about what to do, which is why I think more than ever, it's important that we try and define positive things to do with our time. So I'm going to share with you a couple of quick things that we've done at Bearded lately in our free time away from client work that helped us feel a little better. Um, when Trump did his first attempt at the unethical and unconstitutional Muslim ban, um, we all got pretty upset about it. So I rushed off to my letterpress and spent a couple of days printing these posters. And then we worked with Cotton Bureau to make these t-shirts. We sold them through Cotton Bureau. And we ended up giving all the proceeds to the International Refugee Assistance Project here in New York City. And we raised about 1000 bucks for them. Not bad for two days' work. We also then built this site called the Climate Change Action List. Um, Unfortunately, climate change is fictional, so I don't know why we did that. But <laughs> this website um, assumes that it is not fictional and that there are things you can do to help it in your everyday life. I had trouble finding those things on other websites, so we made this thing. It's a list of things you can change in your life, um, simple things, bigger things. You can check off the ones you want to do and collect them all together in a list and share it with your friends and encourage them to make the same list. Okay? It's at climatechangelist.com. Check it out if you're interested. So my point here is that when we're feeling upset, we're feeling scared, we're feeling alone, we can do things that help a little bit. And if we get in that habit of funneling our fears and anxieties into something positive that helps people, I mean, I don't know, maybe that can make a difference. So this is all great, but there's something else that keeps nagging at me, um, for some reason, particularly this week. And I had some good talks last night with some of the other speakers that are here today about the state of the world and about privilege and about what we can do. And honestly, things got pretty raw pretty quick. It was a couple of drinks going around, uh, sure. But like, it was a tough conversation. And if I'm honest, I, I'm not sure I should be on this stage right now. I was talking with Jen Simmons for quite a while and asked her about her life and her career and her trajectory. And it was fascinating to hear about it. And I feel like I've worked pretty hard. But compared to Jen and what she's accomplished and all the things she's done over the last few decades, I haven't worked hard at all. I haven't really done that much. So what, what am I doing up here? I mean, lately I've had the feeling like I've just sort of glided through my career on a pillow of air. And that sounds like privilege in a nutshell. So what can I do about that? Well, um, does anybody here listen to Two Dope Queens podcast? Yeah! yeah! It's great. If you don't, please go listen to it. It's right here in New York City. I think it's in Brooklyn. Um, if you can catch a live show, it sounds, seems amazing. I just listen from afar. It's hosted by Jessica Williams from The Daily Show and Phoebe Robinson, who are totally amazing. Um, recently, Jessica got into the news because she had a disagreement with Salma Hayek um, about identity and intersectionalism. Um, and coming to her aid was Jill Solway, who is the creator of the TV show Transparent, another great TV show. Um, she came to her defense, and she said this. 
With intersectional feminism, it's our responsibility as white women to recognize that when there are people of color or people who are queer, we need to prioritize your voices and let you speak the loudest and learn from your experience because we haven't been listening. Jill's talking about women here, of course, but this definitely also applies to me. I don't feel like I've been listening enough. And lucky, luckily for all of us, I'm gonna spend a lot of this presentation um, letting other people do the talking. All right, so let's do that now. Now, have I mentioned how much I like NASA? Probably not. I grew up in the 80s, I'm really into NASA. NASA's my jam. I really like Carl Sagan. Um, he had a show called Cosmos in the 80s. They redid some parts in the 90s where he and uh, uh, Andrewian, his co-creator, came back and updated the science for some 90s science. And at the end of one of these episodes, when I watched on Netflix, Carl said this. In our time, a revolution has begun. A revolution perhaps as significant as the evolution of DNA and nervous systems and the innovation of writing. Direct communication amongst billions of human beings is now made possible by computers and satellites. The potential for a global intelligence is emerging, linking all the brains on Earth into a planetary consciousness. A planetary consciousness. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the internet, he's talking about the web, he talks about that thing that we work on every single day. That's what we do. We work on a planetary consciousness. I think sometimes we forget that when we're down in the weeds writing CSS and HTML. So what does this mean for us who are designers as designers? What kind of world are we living in? What are we designing? How do we cope with all of this, this planetary consciousness design that we're doing? For the last three years, I've been working on a documentary film called What Comes Next is the Future, and in this talk, we're gonna be looking at outtakes from that film. And I hope that some of these conversations that didn't make it in the film, that didn't fit the larger narrative arc of the film I was trying to make um, with designers, will come in handy answering those questions. So, a little behind the scenes stuff that I enjoyed that didn't make a good movie. Now, John Tan said in the first issue of the manual, we aren't graphic designers, we're web designers. There's much more to what we do than combining typography, layout, photography, illustration, and color. Web design for John is a new discipline. And yet many of us have come to the web from graphic design, or maybe we were taught by those who came from graphic design. And that's not the same as the World Wide Web. So let's see what some of our friends have to say about that. So I was, I was building web pages on my own, just trying to figure, figure out how to make, make web pages. And at the same time, I was going to design school, uh, learning how to do print design. And during a break, during the session, um, I showed them to my design teacher at the time and just went through and, and basically was just showing what I built, what's out there. And she, I noticed that she said, she talked to me and said, you should do web design. And I turned my head and I looked straight at her and I said, what the heck is web design? No offense to people who are graphic designers, um, but I feel like there's so much thinking and problem solving that has to be done with web design because there's so many different layers to it. There was a point in time where it was really close, you know, and the web was mimicking graphic, you know, print design, which was why, um, you know, you would get these brochure things and people would be like, it's gotta be pixel perfect and all of this stuff. But now it's, it's, it's completely its own medium and has a whole different set of circumstances and things to think about. And it's a lot. It's a lot. You're thinking about internet speeds, users, um, what device they might be on. Are they on the bus? Are they um, at the bus stop? Is it raining outside? How is that going to change how they interact with something? That it can be just stripped into so many different levels um, is kind of exciting and really cool. That, and I don't think that graphic design has that. This is natural and this happens all the time. Whenever a new medium comes along, you tend to borrow from the medium that's come before because it's what you know. Uh, and for the web, it was print that had come before. And there was a lot to learn from print around typography and color and white space and all of that. And processes and workflow as well. We had processes that worked for print and we adapted them for the web, but they were more or less the same. The same ideas of how something would be in production and then something is finished, and then something is, is published, and it's out there. And that's not actually the way the web works. The web 
can be this constant iterative thing. There's this, this concept of being final, right? You know, you've made something and then there's this sort of sweet relief of being done because it's final. But on the web, we, we just don't have that. I just launched something this morning and I immediately had about 15 tweets that said, oh, this looks broken or this is here or, you know, this just doesn't sort of scale right or whatever. And within 10 minutes, I was able to go back, you know, take that feedback, implement it, and then push it back out and say, you know, thank you, Internet, for, for making this thing better, right, for fixing my problems. So print and its 500 plus years of evolution um, doesn't always apply to this world of screens that we're on. And this really became obvious with mobile. So let's check in with our friends again and see how mobile broke their process. When I first started building websites, we only had basically one screen size to focus on, 800 pixels by 600 pixels. And then gradually over time, those got larger. 1024 by 768 was like the monitor I had for, for the longest time. And you'd build websites, you'd lay those out in Photoshop to fit the space that you had. And as screen sizes got larger, so did the websites that we built. And then when the phone came around, it was like, okay, well, I just have to worry about this 1024 by 768 and then this 320 by 240. That's all I have to worry about. And then tablets came around. And it was a sort of thing that dawned on me where I realized that essentially all of this custom stuff I was doing with CSS to these HTML documents in some ways was just breaking the, the portability of those things. And that having to pinch and zoom around a fixed width site is not ideal. I was pretty aware of, of um, the responsive work that Ethan was doing from a very early stage, but I don't think I knew the term until I saw him speaking. I think it was the event apart in Seattle and he blew everybody away. Everyone was like, the, the, you could sense like people in the room were like, holy shit. <laughs> And I remember Eric Meyer had been talking about media queries and then Ethan came up and said, oh yeah, I got media queries and just like threw his mic down and just blew everyone's mind. There was something about the talk, like you could feel it in the audience. Like everyone just like became more and more electric. It's like, yes, this is, yes, this is a thing that we are witnessing that this is a huge shift and it's, a, it's not a shift that's coming. It's not a, hey, one day you're going to be able to do this. This is right now. I remember I pulled up Ethan's demo in the browser and I squished it. I realized that this thing was going to dismantle my process completely. That the way that we worked with each other at Paravel, that was all gone. And now I had to find a new way to sort of express myself creatively, to solve problems and a new approach. Um, and so my first reaction was, this is terrible. I, I wish it would go away and I don't want to deal with it. There was no denial from me. I knew it was right and I knew it had to be. You just didn't want to do it. I just dived into depression. It's like, I don't know whether I've got the energy anymore to learn yet another major thing. I, I can just about cope with that kind of incremental evolution of the web that goes on the whole time. But when you drop something major on me like that, it's like, okay, here we go again. You know, it was that kind of feel. I had to let go of kind of the way I liked to design um, by myself in Photoshop, kind of thinking through everything, but really embracing um, responsive web design as a practice and, and, and using all those tools to think of pages as like networks of content and components. And um, the minute I did that, I sort of found a new way to uh, control the process and to be creative within all of that. But initially, I thought it was terrible. Uh, it moved my cheese, so. All right, so Steve Jobs moved trans cheese, right? But then Ethan Marcotte and Responsive Design gave us a new way to look at our work, a way which was perhaps closer to the medium. And as those devices multiplied, thanks, Samsung, um, Responsive Design has become the de facto standard for how we design for the web. But it's not just a handful of CSS techniques, it's a different mindset, a mindset that's not necessarily the easiest things for designers to acquire because it's about seeding control. It's really interesting as I've kind of grown up and, and I've met more and more designers over the years. We're a certain type of person. You know, I, I, I remember going out for a meal once with Mark Bolton and he, we were sitting at the, the table in the restaurant and he started lining things up on the table which is something I do. I don't know whether you do it as well. But 
and, and you know, our minds just work in that way. We have this desire to create order out of chaos, to, uh, to put things in a logical, ordered manner. The web sort of requires that we control as much as we can up until the point that we realize we have to relinquish control and that we have to let the content be consumed the way our users want to consume that content or need to consume that content. Ever since the web was introduced, it's always been this fluid environment, but I've seen a lot of designers fight back uh, trying to create this fixed world. Uh, I think that you know, the, the more we embrace the fluidity of the web, the easier it is uh, to manage. There's always this tension between like um, what we want the web to be and what the web just kind of is. I mean, when we finally figured out that there's actually like a mobile web out there, right? It's like, no, we need all these massive device databases and we need separate mobile and desktop websites and we need to, you know, ensure that, you know, we're designing for those contexts. The web kind of just defies easy definition, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, so, yeah, the less things we try to control with it, I think the better we do as an industry. The main thing that I, that I learned working with these mobile devices is, is that you really can't count on anything. That was a while, you know, to, to get to that point, right, in my process where it's just like, hey, maybe it's okay if things are a little broken and accept a little gray. In the past where web design was maybe more of a, a one-way street where the designer was dictating the terms of engagement, saying, okay, you're going to be able to access this website and do what you need to do, but you must have a fast connection, you must have a web browser with certain capabilities, you must have a screen that's a certain size. Now it's much more of a two-way street, more of, a, more of a conversation, where the user is saying, well, I'm using this browser on this kind of device or computer. And the designer is saying, okay, I can accommodate that. Uh, you're not going to get the same experience that somebody on a better browser or bigger screen is going to get, but I'm going to make sure you can accomplish your task. The key thing, though, for a designer to be able to do that is that they have to give up the idea that there is one canonical way that this website is supposed to look or feel. There's going to be different capabilities, and that, that's not a bad thing. So it's not a bad thing for things to look different in different browsers and devices and situations, as Jeremy points out. And in that way, responsive web design is a natural continuation of progressive enhancement. But responsive design also means bigger, more complicated design problems. So when we're trying to solve those problems, how can we be sure that we're making good decisions? Well, Steve Jobs said, design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. And when we talk about how it works, what we're really talking about is the design of user experiences. And UX says that we can't just assume that our designs work. We have to use research, observation, testing, iteration. We have to do science. In iteration, it means a more fluid, adaptable process on the web, a process that perhaps makes even more sense in this responsive world we found ourselves in. Quantitative research is extremely helpful when it comes to uh, local optimization. So, uh, to, you know, trying to maximize the value out of the design that you have, but it doesn't lead to large conceptual breakthroughs. And that's where qualitative user research can be very helpful. A lot of research right now is happening where people have an idea or they have a product and service and they want to figure out what are the needs and behavior of people that we either want to use as, you know, have be our customers or our current customers. What can we do to innovate our product or our service or what can we do to take it to the next level? This concept of going out and listening to people and hearing the way that they think sounds a little like it could be open to interpretation. It sounds a little uh, rickety as compared to numeric analysis, as compared to all that reams of data that you're getting back every second from the interactions that your customers are already having with your offering. But the thing that the numbers don't show you are what that person is thinking. Uh, they tell you what that person did. It doesn't say why. And it turns out that when you start using uh, people's words and looking for patterns between the way different people think, um, you get correlation. 
uh, you get pretty strong correlation. You get repeatable correlation. Once a uh, concept is nailed down and uh, there's a general direction for um, the point of view, then usability testing comes in really handy to try to get at uh, the specific designs of the flows or the interface, uh, the language, uh, to see if it makes sense to people and uh, if, if the experience matches their expectations. What you do in essence in usability testing, you, know, you sit someone down in front of the design and you sit back and you don't say anything. You just basically say, please use this. And they don't see the same design you see because the design you saw um, uh, had all of the knowledge about its inner workings and all of the knowledge about what the, the client or stakeholders wanted this thing to do and all the knowledge of what came before it. And to them, it's like I'm walking up to this thing. It's like, oh, what the hell is that? I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. The best application of usability testing that I found is uh, when it's done very rapidly and iteratively. Uh, so you have the full team involved and they're engaged in watching the studies and, um, and really understanding, okay, what's working, what's not working, and then taking those insights after just a few participants um, to iterate again and then go back into the study to try alternative variations. We keep treating these tasks as these sort of like independent silos when there's so much more um, tightly linked than we might like to think. So, I mean, the best projects that I've ever worked on, they're like tiny iteration loops over design and development. Uh, that's how we worked with the Globe, where we would, you know, um, knock out some designs into a responsive prototype. We'd sort of test them on a bunch of different devices. We'd take art direction from that point on. The design that we were, were basically vetting and critiquing was live HTML and CSS in the browser. Um, and I think the more prototyping I'm able to do earlier and earlier in the project has been great for testing things like, you know, performance, whether it's actual or perceived, for figuring out, like, what kind of content issues are we going to have as we move from one screen type to another. So that, that's, that's changed the way that I work. Um, more prototyping, more actual device testing as a design tool um, has been a really big help for me. There's nothing more valuable than a prototype, than looking uh, at the site, using the site in the browser, um, get, getting a feel for how it is and how it moves and um, how the content lays out. I think once you sort of get a little bit of practice doing that, you can still use image layout tools if those are the quickest thing for you. But um, though I use those differently now and it's more of a, of a quick iteration, quick idea thing. And um, over time, once you sort of get an idea for how, how content's gonna lay out on a page, and how it's going to change and re-architect itself uh, at different viewports, you can sort of use those tools understanding the implications of the choices you might make in Photoshop, understanding what you may do there, how, you know, being, basically being accountable to yourself as to how that's going to actually function and work in the browser. So what we begin to see emerging here is an iterative cycle of research and design. Uh, starting with generative research, that's just research that generates new ideas. So those might be stakeholder or user interviews, uh, they might be diary studies, they might be uh, competitor analysis. And then we take what we've learned from that and we bring that into our initial designs. These are our first prototypes of some kind, whether they're in code or on paper or in mockups or whatever, that try to express our solution for the things we learned about in the, in the generative research. Then we can take those initial designs and test our assumptions, uh, use some evaluative research. This is research that evaluates the design, right? So this might be uh, usability testing, for instance. We take what we learn from that, and we refine our designs. And if we still have questions about our new approaches that came out of that, maybe some of them were straightforward and obvious. If we change this word, people will understand what the button means, and it's done. Maybe they're more complicated. There's this whole interface that people just don't get and can't figure out and can't get past. We need to try something else, and we don't know what's going to work yet. And then we run it into some more evaluative research, and ultimately more refinement. And we can continue to do this cycle over and over again uh, until we see diminishing returns and we're just not getting a lot of value out of it or we are running out of uh, time or budget or money or whatever, right? Um, and even if we end up discovering issues that we can't fix right then, at least we know they exist and we can try to address them in the future. Now an iterative approach like this requires a lot of different skills. And that tends to mean that a web designer is not alone means they're part of a team. Good web design is a team sport. I think you need a lot of perspective uh, to solve problems. Multidisciplinary teams that are working pretty closely together that can have conversations about 
you know, is this going to be able to be implemented and is this, this going to be performant um, is really important. Now we're trying to be more iterative. We're trying to be more true to the web. And a lot of that involves much more collaboration, um, much more uh, just having people sit together and work through stuff, a, having people having complementary skills, and that they aren't working in silos and, and throwing things over the wall, that they're sitting down together and figuring stuff out. Designers and developers, I think, can work incredibly well together. We've got two guys at Headscape. We've got um, a guy called Dan um, and a guy called Ed, and Ed is our um, designer, um, and Dan is our front-end coder. But Dan knows how to do a bit of design, and Ed knows how to do a bit of code, and they work so great together. And there is tension sometimes, and they argue and, and disagree with one another, but it's a really good, solid relationship. They sit you know, side by side in the office, and they work together, and they produce amazing stuff because there's no division between them. There's none of this throw it over the wall. One of the challenges, I think, with a lot of early um, digital product design uh, was that it was driven by this visionary kind of sensibility in terms of that, that high-level, uh, big-picture emotive quality, but the figuring out the details often wasn't uh, part of that equation, and so the, the experiences would fall apart because they just wouldn't work, they wouldn't make sense, it would be hard to use. So the user experience folks are coming in with this more bottom-up, let's, let's understand all the piece parts and how they can work together and how we can organize them to create something that that people get, that people fundamentally understand. The shortcoming of the user experience approach is that it often lacks that uh, emotional tenor. It, it can leave people feeling flat. The projects that I've worked on that have succeeded best are those that marry that bottom-up user experience view and top-down top down big picture view, um, and, and where those groups are working together. You can't do any of this stuff by yourself. You're really you know, bound to work with the, pe the people on your team, if it's a client services thing, you're bound to talk a lot about the, the build with your clients and you're having to share and talk about different views and everything is sort of multi-dimensional uh, now. So it makes the process a lot dirtier, um, but also I've, I've found it a lot more rewarding. I think kind of at the end of the day, it, it takes a lot more from the entire team, a lot more trust, a lot more communication. And um, the things that you ship at the end of the day, usually uh, you're more proud of because of it. All right, so we're likely to be working in teams, and these could be made up of content strategists, project managers, designers, accessibility experts, and one of an infinite variety of developers. And it can be hard to keep track of all the web skills that are expected of us. Milton Glaser said, to design is to communicate clearly by whatever means you can control or master. But with so many skills out there, what do we even expect from a single designer? It's just the inevitability of you know, an increasingly sophisticated and complex platform like the web that we have to specialise. That day when you had the person who pretty much knew everything from kind of the server and how to optimise that through to kind of optimising the front end, and I think that day is in some ways sadly gone, but the truth is you know, as, as a platform gets more complex and sophisticated, that's just a reality. I'm sure when they first made cars, there were people who kind of pretty much could build a whole car and design it and do, you know, like, well, and certainly with, air, you know, early aircraft, they, you know, the Wright brothers built the plane, then they flew the plane. But as those systems get more and more complicated, it's just a reality that no one has enough time to specialise enough in the areas where they work. When I was building the team at Yahoo, I mean, we would take people, we would draw from all kinds of disciplines, library science, uh, architecture, graphic design, computer science, and I found that the best designers are ones who really have interests and strengths across multiple disciplines because user experience is such a multidisciplinary field. I was the biggest pain in the ass when I moved into this industry. The, the guys who uh, I worked with, I worked with this amazing team who sort of brought me in and they taught me uh, how to design for the web. I questioned everything. You know, why can't I make, why can't I make the, the text circular. Um, this is like, you know, back in 2002 when this was just, it made no sense to do something like that. You know, this was something very difficult to do and why can't I kern all my letters? Why can't I use small caps? I learned the hard way by doing everything wrong and seeing it happen and see why um, those things didn't make sense to do, you know, why it caused more problems, why it was difficult to interact with things. I do think that that uh, contributed a lot to my own success. 
um, because it was, it, that's my own technical background, because I majored in electrical and computer engineering as an undergrad. My own technical background um, made it possible for me to relate to the engineers that I was working with at Netscape and Yahoo in the early days. Um, and, um, you know, I could establish relationships with them, I could empathize with them, have credibility with them, and negotiate with them much more effectively because of it. There's a lot that goes into making a website. And I think it's kind of like you know what areas you're the strongest in, and then it kind of fizzles, lot, fizzles out from there. So, and it goes the same way for a developer. They should have basic design understanding. They should know how to extend a system the same way as a designer can go in and, and start finessing typography in code and, and that type of thing. So I think it's more about meaningful overlap and figuring out where your role overlaps and, and where you're specializing in. Uh, that's the most important. All right, so let's take a practical example, OK? Let's start with someone that we might refer to as a communication designer. Uh, maybe they went to school for design uh, and have a lot of experience in user interface design. Next, they spend some time working in a multidisciplinary team. They start picking up some front-end development, maybe trying to render some of their designs in code a little bit. Um, and then, the more they work, they start picking up a little project management so they can argue for their projects and their work with clients directly, and then absorb a little bit of user research, content strategy, information architecture, by osmosis, if nothing else, just by collaborating with other people. This starts to look like a pretty well-rounded designer. They have a primary expertise in one area, UI design, a secondary focus in front-end development, and a broad understanding of UX-related areas and project management to help them communicate and collaborate with others. Let's take another one. Someone who starts off, say, is primarily a front-end developer. And then, perhaps, um, being immersed in building content management system-based websites, CMS websites, um, they start getting into content models uh, and data models, uh, designing the structure of the content. And so they start picking up content strategy. These two things actually go very well together. Um, this is a career path very similar to a friend of mine, Jeff Eaton, who works at Lullabot, that started as a developer and then moved into content strategy. He found that really fascinating. It has a lot to do with setting up the fields for a content type in a CMS. It has a lot to do with planning out the content model uh, beforehand, right? And then over time, Perhaps they pick up some other skills, some more information architecture, and, and more of these adjacent fields that help them be useful throughout the entire project cycle um, in different ways, and also be able to relate to their teammates and, and have good conversations about uh, what dependencies exist and how what the work they're doing might affect other people's work and vice versa, right? So again, having this sort of deep expertise in one area with a supporting secondary focus and broad adjacent knowledge is really, really helpful and makes you a really valuable member of the team. And this really begs the question, should designers code? I'm going to let other people feel that one. It feels fair enough. So here we go. I started thinking about doing websites in like 1995. And I had a friend, and he had a website, and apparently it was doing really well. And I was talking to him about it. And he was like, yeah, you know, it's cool, but you're going to have to learn how to do computer code. And like said it like really seriously, like this is like some serious stuff. And like, I don't know if you can handle it. Uh, it goes without saying, I think, what designers should know code. Uh, and print designers should know how print presses work. It may not be like know every single thing about code and every best practice out there, but knowing what that technology is capable of, whether it is HTML and CSS, or you're moving into JavaScript and HTML5, um, kind of like the rich video and audio elements, knowing the capabilities should then kind of come back into the early design process, but I think it doesn't hurt to code just a little bit, if not a lot. Web designers should understand the concepts of CSS and HTML to the point where they can, they can use it to benefit the interactions and the builds and the systems that they're creating. Um, I know HTML and CSS, am I going to build a production level site with it? No, I shouldn't because there's a point where you begin to understand your strengths and your weaknesses, but can I talk? with a developer about it? Do I understand how responsive design works? Yes. Having a good understanding of the fundamentals of, of code is really good and, and helpful for a designer. I still think that there's benefit to someone that is specializing in design but has kind of like a, a supplementary 
understanding of development. That's what I do. I try to be really mindful of um, development and, and, and how I work with developers, but I'm not a developer. I'm st I still very much consider myself a designer, not a developer. I think that that's been one of the, the most revealing things. Um, you know, the, the biggest epiphanies for me is like, yeah, this whole code thing is actually still design. I feel very often, you know, I have a better understanding of, of how this stuff works uh, in its final environment than, than, you know, the other designers who are working in an abstraction. Once you learn HTML and CSS, it really clicks and, it, and you understand why you went through that entire journey of doing it. But until then, it doesn't seem like uh, it makes a lot of sense to do it. I mean, I kind of try and think about it a little bit like fashion designers, right? Like fashion design has been uh, a, something that people have practiced for a long time. It has a long history. And you wouldn't expect someone like Marc Jacobs or a, a big name fashion designer to sew his own clothes, but he knows how to sew a prototype or at least to create a prototype enough to send it to somebody to make a production level design. And I think that's really what it comes down to is knowing enough to be able to communicate properly how to build or make something. So designers are still designers. Uh, that's their primary field. But when your medium is the web, it doesn't hurt to have knowledge of the medium on which you work to be as effective as possible. So knowing at least how HTML and CSS work um, gives you a, a better understanding. And, and the more you can learn, the more opportunities there are with regards to rendering your designs in the browser yourself. So if you really care about your designs, that's pretty cool, right? It gives you more control over what you're working on or more ways to experiment. So if code is one direction the designer might move in, what about that most nebulous term of user experience? Peter Morville said, the design of good houses requires an understanding of both the construction materials and the behavior of real humans. So if HTML and CSS and JavaScript are our construction materials, then human behavior starts to point us at UX. But when the term UX comes up, um, sometimes there's a little bit of eye rolling in the room, like what does that even mean? Is it just uh, a discipline aligning itself around the use of sticky notes? Possibly. So what do we mean when we say user experience? User experience design is a more holistic way of approaching design than uh, traditional, uh, uh, say, graphic design practices. User experience design takes into account interaction design, information architecture, usability engineering, as well as graphic design, and kind of is an umbrella of pulling all these things together, recognizing that a user's experience emerges from the uh, kind of interaction of all these different uh, uh, feeders as opposed to being any one thing. User experience design is about how you move people through the experience. So in contrast to graphic design, which is more about aesthetics and uh, what you see, which is also very important, uh, user experience is about the flow. So it means that you have to understand what motivates people, um, how do they think, um, how do they feel about, you know, after they interact with your site. It's about understanding people's needs. Um, and helping them achieve their goals. And so user experience design typically focuses on the functional and kind of systemic design qualities. How are people going to kind of move through or engage with a, uh, a digital product? When you click a button, what happens? What's next? Uh, when you're creating a menu or some navigation structure, what are the things that you put next to each other and why? What are the things that you put within those categories and why? Those are the uh, elements that are typically considered user experience design. There's all sorts of, um, you know, other tools and um, practices that fall under user experience, such as usability testing, interaction design, which is designing the way that um, software reacts to a user user's input, essentially. Um, there's information architecture, which um, itself is a big expansive field. Information architecture, um, to me, has always been the central part of any kind of experience whether it's online or in print, or it's the way content is laid out and displayed, it's the way information is presented, it's the organization of that, the prioritization of that. And um, now as we get into interaction and path flows, it becomes the way that we see through an experience and how we get from point A to point B and you know what happens in between. So information architecture, you know, writ large is the design of any information space uh, with the intent of making it kind of findable, accessible, understandable. Uh, uh, people don't get lost 
uh, trying to figure out what they're doing. They're, they're able to find what it is they're looking for. How do I find the right product on Amazon? How do I find the right clothes on Gap.com? Whatever it is. Those are information architecture problems. What are the categories? Men, women, children, etc. Uh, for, a, for a clothing store. How do then within men, is it tops? Is it shirts? Is it, if it's tops, is it jackets and shirts? Within shirts, is it casual button down dress? Formal, like all of those labels, that's information architecture. A good user experience professional needs to understand how to do research, needs to understand how interactions are designed, needs to understand how information can be designed, needs to understand the architecture parts of the information, how you create the navigation of the design or how you organize the content within the design, needs to understand the visuals, how, how you, you make something both aesthetically pleasing and at the same time, prioritizing the visual information so that the most important thing the user needs is the thing that jumps off the, the screen or off the device, whereas the things that they might need down the road become evident at that moment when they need it. Um, needs to understand how to, how to work on a design team because there's a lot of effort that involves iterating and, and changing how things go. Needs to be able to uh, uh, get feedback from users, bring that in, and, and, and needs to be able to create uh, needs to be able to to say no uh, that's too much functionality we want to you know that thing is not going to make the design better it's just going to add complexity and make it more complicated so let's just leave that out and and so that sort of editing curation capability is really important so what have we learned about ourselves today fellow designers for one thing, it's a bigger, messier world that we're designing for. And there's so many useful skills for designing for the web, there are many ways you could choose in your development path as a designer. And lately, I've been envisioning this as one big old Venn diagram, which unfortunately is very dark on this screen. But we're going to try it anyway. All right. You could find yourself at various intersections here, like, for instance, the intersection of UX, design, and code. And maybe we have another designer who's just devoted to designing and coding. And maybe a third who's just UX and design. And a fourth who splits their time between code and research. Now, these are four different designers. And together, they can accomplish a lot. They can shift between different tasks based on the project or the phase within the project. And this may all seem like a lot. It might seem like a lot to take in and a lot to master, and it, and it is. But isn't that why you all got into this in the first place? The web never sits still, and neither do you. And that's why you love it. That's why you chose to work on a planetary consciousness. And you can handle it. Why? Because you're awesome. That's why. <laughs> I'm still Matt Griffin. Thank you very much for having me today.